All right, hi, everybody. A um, lot of friendly faces in the audience. Oh, thank you all for smiling. That's what I need. Um, I have some disclaimers of my own. I do have a potty mouth like Gab. It's probably why we bonded, so if I drop an F-bomb, I apologize. Um, before we get started, I want everybody to get a pen out. If you don't have one, borrow one. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. And you're going to want this that was on your chair, this beautiful skyline. This is a postcard. Uh, it was designed by my friend Julie, who also does all the creative work for uh, Deco. She happens to be here. This was a collaboration that we had. Um, and in fact, I like the story because it represents a risk that she took. We were both building our businesses at the same time, and we both wanted more time for creativity. Um, and this is really something she wanted to do, it was something Deco wanted, so she designed this beautiful skyline. Um, I feel she did it, I feel like I own it because I freaking love it. Um, so what we're going to do today, I want you to address this, it's a postcard, I want you to address it to yourself, play along. I'm not going to ask you to do like a trust circle or anything like that. Um, if you're like me, and um, I'm told this is a creative bunch, I know you're a creative bunch, um, ideas are going to pop in your head today. Not necessarily brilliant things that I say, but you're going to see a picture and it's going to make something resonate. You're going to have some crazy moment. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is hanging on to those moments. So as those moments happen, I want you to write yourself a letter or a postcard or notes. I am going to collect these at the end and I'm going to mail them to you in a couple of weeks. Okay, this is going to remind you of those brilliant insights that you had. I know you have them, right? You're in the car and something, you're like, ah, somebody should do that. <laughs> that's, that's what I want you to record today. Um, some of you are going to start to do it and then you're going to be like, no, nah, I don't want to do this. So I'm going to add an incentive. Um, we're going to collect these at the end before we all disperse. Um, and I'm going to grab out of the pile, and I'm going to give you uh, give away two goodies from Deco. One is a swell bottle, and if you don't have one, it is the hot item of the season. Um, the other is a $25 gift card to Deco. Okay, I really want you to do this. Um, I stole this from a program that I did, and when the when the postcard came back, it was really intense. It was like I had forgotten some of the things I had. Um, it was really a great reminder of kind of being in that creative moment. So I'm not going to read these. I may write a little smiley face or something on it, but um, this, is a, this, is a, this is a message to yourself, okay? All right, so here we go. Um, everybody's got a pen, right? If you need to borrow one, borrow one. My topic is risk. Uh, I will tell you right now I'm not an expert. I'm not a PhD in risk management, none of that. Um, I... What I really want to do today is sort of tell you some stories and hopefully um, say some things that resonate with you. Uh, there, I've learned a lot of things about myself over the years that I'm going to share. And um, I'm 55 and almost 56, and I'm hoping that um, some of you who are not that age uh, will figure some of these things out a little sooner, and some of you who are my age um, will we'll also figure these out in time. There's the beautiful postcard um, from Julie. Uh, so that's a reminder. And um, by the way, being 55, I watched all these wonderful presentations. And they're doing the whole Oprah thing, you know, like TED Talk, this is great, blah, blah, walking around the room. Blah, blah, blah. I can't do that shit. <laughs> so not only that, but this is 20 point type, so I can read it without my glasses. So. Um, so I did watch a lot of the um, previous uh, Creative Mornings talks. I've been to a few. One of the things I realized as I was thinking about risk and, is, and listening to them is that every single one of these speakers has taken some kind of a risk. You know, we heard about ethics. We heard about, we've heard about change and collaboration, um, shock, humility, failure. All of those things are associated with risk taking. Um, it it kind of got me thinking about um, other people who've taken risks and what have the results been. You know, I thought, well, God, the person who designed the Eiffel Tower, no way everybody loved that. Everybody was probably like, that's the ugliest damn building, and now it's iconic, right? So, of course, I did what everybody does when they're doing a 
paper, at least everybody in 12th grade. I went to the internet, I looked up definitions, <laughs> and I did some Googling. Um, so here comes that part of the presentation. Um, first of all, um, I, I, I w was kind of reading about all these historic events. Um, every single one of them, every single one of them involves somebody taking a risk, period. It might have been a little risk, it might have been a big risk, it might have been bodily harm, it might have been risking putting themselves out there for an idea. But I, I was sort of overwhelmed by this feeling of, wow, if you think about it, that really, if history is a chronicle of everything that's happened before us, history is really a chronicle of risk taking. And I'm having this like, oh my god, I can't believe I thought of that, oh wow, that's so brilliant. Yeah, well, so did somebody else. Um, <laughs> not only that, but somebody took the quote and put it on a stupid little meme. So here it is. <laughs> only those who play win, only those who risk win. History favors risk takers, forgets the timid. Everything else is commentary. A little heady, but uh, seriously, it's kind of true. Um, so then I start thinking about this relative to my own personal history, and I challenge you to think about your own history. If you start thinking about sort of momentous times in your life um, and what was connected to those, I realized that a lot of those memories involved risk. It might have been me mouthing off at somebody and getting, you know, shut up really quick, or it might have been... Um, uh, something I thought I could do and I gave it a try. So I realized that my own personal history was peppered with risks and I suspect you will uh, realize the same thing if you start kind of thinking back about how you got to be how you are. Um, yeah, so I did the definition thing and I, I um, Jonathan <laughs> was looking at my slides, bless you darling, um, and he was like, um, so these slides are great, except, you know, a lot of people do this whole definition thing. I'm like, I know, I'm doing it tongue in cheek. <laughs> um, so, and I started to take it out, but I have a quote coming up. And so I want you to read these definitions, because um, there's a quote coming up that I, a couple of quotes that I think really kind of nail it and speak to this crowd. It speaks about the connection between creativity, imagination, innovation, risk. It's absolutely key to who everyone here is. So I'm not going to read them to you, because that's why we write them on the PowerPoint. All right. This I love. Um, interestingly, the two quotes I love the most were from Forbes. Um, this one talks about how creativity is the art of act of making something from nothing. And it doesn't have to be creating a piece of art, though that's sort of a traditional way, but it's, it's creating something out of nothing. Um, and what I like is this wording. It requires making public those bets first placed by the imagination. This is not a job for the timid. This is you guys, okay? Further quotes. I'll let you read the first part. Basically, uh, second author, but it picks up where the other guy um, started, and he talks about how um, there's a visceral uh, trained part of us that when we're in danger, and risk inherently involves danger, sorry, um, when we're in danger we go into problem solving mode and creative people can dig deeper and deeper and deeper to solve problems. That's what makes you good at being creative people. Um, risk therefore causes your mind to stretch its muscles. It creates mandatory conditions for innovation. I think this is really interesting. Uh, it trains your brain to think in unusual ways. It trains your brain to be more creative. So if there is no other reason than to embrace risk and go with it, um, I think that pretty much nails it uh, for a creative group of people. All right, so I'm going to tell you some, some stories. <laughs> this is 1975. Yeah, that's me in the white overalls. Pretty scary, right? Um, <laughs> let me catch up with my notes here while you chuckle at the dorkiness of this. Um, one of the things I realized is um, that this, this creative brain, um, wait a minute, another thing you need to know about me is when I get wound up, I, um, what do they say? Women don't sweat. They, I glow. I'm glowing. I'm glowing. <laughs> I also have allergies, so... Basically, I'll just drip my way through this presentation. <laughs> okay. 
So I was born in 1960. I was raised in the 60s and 70s. Um, I realize that's before many of you were born. Um, I was raised in the D.C. area, so uh, in an activist family, so we went and marched on Washington and, you know, did all that stuff. Um, but in the 70s, uh, girls were still not getting empowered the way they are now. Um, we were still trying to figure that out. I was a smart kid, um, but I was in this track to be, because I was a smart kid, I was put in this sort of AP track, right? So whenever I wanted to take an art class, I was told, mm -mm, mm -mm, not serious. You need to be serious. You're, you're, you're a girl, you got brains, this is what you have to do. So interesting, but I, um, and it's nobody's fault. It's just the way things were culturally then. I was never really encouraged to do traditional creativity. Um, so what I was repressing was this entrepreneurial brain, or not identifying, I guess. Um, so to the picture. My little sister, who's the uh, freckle-faced redhead with the glasses, um, was on this soccer team. And they had one of those absolute stereotypical dickhead fathers coaching this thing, screaming at the girls like it was the goddamn World Cup, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, these girls, this was amoeba ball, right? They just follow the soccer ball around in a cluster, and somebody falls, and they're like, are you okay? And they're picking flowers, and this guy was just awful. And, it killed me. I sat on the, I sat on the sideline just thinking, oh, and I kept thinking, anybody could do better than this guy. Anybody could. And, and I played soccer, and I kept thinking, um, I could do this so much better. Never said anything. Well, surprise, surprise, the guy gets kicked out of the league, and they need a soccer coach. Something just happened. Like, open my mouth, pick me. <laughs> so I'm 15, um, and I'm coaching this group of seven, eight-year-olds, um, doing something that only dads did. Moms didn't do it. Even if the moms were athletes, it was the dads who coached. Um, and interestingly, um, instead of yelling, instead of pushing, I was like, ah, we're going to make a game out of this. I got checkers and taught them how to move around on the field. Well, they learned how to play their positions, and we killed everybody. Because if you've ever watched these kids play, all you need is one person out here to catch the ball and one person out here, because the rest of them are moving like this, right? So, um, so all of a sudden, we're the champions. We're the kick-ass champions. The dads who thought it was scandalous that I was coaching, all of a sudden it was OK I was coaching, because, yeah, we won a trophy. And that was, by the way, in the 70s, you didn't get a trophy for every game. You, you, won, you got the trophy if you won the league. Um, <laughs> we actually got to meet Pele. That was a big deal. Um, so so I, I think about this as sort of one of the first times I took a risk, kind of despite myself. Um, and uh, as I was thinking about it, I was sort of patting myself on the back. I don't know where the hell that came from. It just kind of came out. But it was something that I was buried. And it was an example of those things that kind of tick at you, tick at you, tick at you. They're always in the back of your mind thinking, oh, I should do that. I should do that. I really ought to do that. Yeah, tomorrow I'll get to that. Tomorrow I'll get that. Those are the things I want you to write down on your postcards today. OK? Um, I learned some things as well. Uh, first of all, this idea of risk, danger. I don't, I don't, for me, the danger was getting yelled at or laughed off the field or whatever. That turned around pretty quickly for the girls. There was no danger. They'd had the worst case scenario of a coach. Um, and so it was all good. Um, I, we won using different techniques. So I got some confidence in thinking about things differently. Um, and of course, it was a huge ego boost having a whole little pa passel of a whole little pack of eight year olds thinking I was the second coming. Who, who can argue with that, right? Um, I also learned about, sorry again, I also learned about unintended consequences, which I think is a huge piece of risk. You take risks, you, you anticipate what the outcomes could be, but, um, oh my goodness, is it really already 9.30? Good God, Jonathan. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, I'm going to stop. Okay, unintended consequences, good things happen after this. I'm going to start talking a little faster. So this is, my, this is my big message to you. If it's still in your mind, it's worth taking the risk. And this is a Paolo Coelho, who's a really great author. Um, all right, I'm going to blow through uh, this piece, because I would like to get to the deco piece. Um, 
the, the next thing is that I got into this nonprofit career, which I did for 25 years. That's what my life looked like six years ago. Um, suits, high-heeled shoes, meetings, raising money, blah, 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 blah. Not, I don't regret it, it was all good stuff. Um, I learned a lot, but you know what I, um, what I learned is I was living someone else's mission. Right? I was raising money, I was putting my passion into a mission that was somebody else's. Not a bad mission, it was a good mission, but it wasn't mine. Um, and I'm greedy that way. So I did this leadership development program, which I'm not going to go into all the details of, um, but one of the things they had us do was a, um, he called it a vision board. We sat there with magazines and cut them all up and made this vision board, and he wanted four quadrants. Uh, personal, um, spiritual, work, family, I think. So everybody sat and cut these things up, and we all went home, and it was a Friday, and I couldn't get this out of my head, and I literally went into, I know some of you have been in these, this is my first real one, a, a creative frenzy. This, this thing came out. So I built this thing, um, which now, by the way, hangs where I can see it when I wake up first thing in the morning. Um, and this was, this was kind of a moment where I realized maybe I needed to be doing something else. Um, I had a big long story about how I was ready to leave the organization, they were ready for me to go, blah, 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 blah. Um, had a huge aha moment when one of the coaches uh, asked me, looked at all my, all my, you know, they do all these tests, the Myers-Briggs and the this and that, and she looked at all my tests and she said, she said, are you happy? And I said, no, she said, I'm not surprised. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, she said, well, what's your heart's desire? And I said, well, this is weird. I believe I'm going to open a store. I just want to do something creative. I want to help creative people, blah, blah, blah. She's like, that's perfect. So she's pointing to all this data, right? So this is what it felt like. That's my... <laughs> Um, so that was my aha moment. I got smacked upside the head, left the organization um, by mutual agreement, and um, about a year later opened Deco. So let me catch up in my notes um, and hopefully flip over a lot of pages so I don't make Jonathan nervous. <laughs> All right, so um, I, what I want to do is tell you the story of how how this transition happened. Now, I'm, I'm talking about starting a business, but, and that may not be the creative act that some of you need to do. It might just be um, you know, a, a work of art that you've been thinking about or an organization you've been wanting to help get off the ground or a, a public project that you want to contribute to. Um, so apply these lessons to your own situation and don't just dismiss it and say, well, I'm not starting a business because that's not the point. And hopefully you'll see that that's not the point. So the first thing I think that was really key in opening Deco was support. Um, that's a scary damn thing to leave a 25-year career, to walk away from a good salary Will you have three kids in college. Yep, I had three kids in college. Um, to uh, literally dive into something you know nothing about. Sure, I have shopped in stores, um, and I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to create a, an environment like stores that I had been in, but um, I, didn't, I didn't know how to run a freaking cash register. I don't know how to do this. Um, so, um, and I'm, by the way, I'm married to a scientist, so our Myers-Briggs like this, right? So um, the, whole, the whole I'd like to jump off this cliff thing was scary as shit for him. Um, and, and of course, my, the store, when people asked me about it, I couldn't really articulate it. It's like, well, it's going to be a gift store, but it's going to be way cooler than anything you've ever been. And I'm like, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so, so support is huge. Um, and I will say, since opening Deco, um, I absolutely one zillion percent could not do it without my friends who are all sitting over here, all my peeps, um, who are also creative brains. And we get together and we talk about the challenges. And, and so, so that's another message, really. Find people who think the way you do. Don't think that the way you think is anomalous, therefore bad. Find your people. And my god, if any place to find your people, it's in this room right now. Um, I hope you feel as at home as I do. So the next thing is um, to make a plan. Now. It, you know, obviously your plan's going to look like one thing if you are um, 
creating a sculpture, um, and it's going to look something like something different when you're creating a business. But there is that panic moment, right? There's that, oh, holy shit, I can't pull this off. I've left my job. I am, like, not able to feed my children. No, not really. Um, <laughs> I've left my job. I've, I've turned everything upside down. I've made commitments, yet I'm not sure I can do this. So um, I started freaking out just a little bit. Um, but what I... What I urge you to do when you have that moment is to write down all those questions. And here's the thing. Your plan should answer those questions. When people talk about a business plan, I will tell you this. I mentor a lot of people who want to start their own business. And I cannot tell you how often people come to me and it's all up here. Yeah, that's fine. But if you're like me and like most human beings, that X thousand dollars you're going to make on this, you spend 47 times over here. And until you put that in a spreadsheet and see the negative at the bottom and force yourself to actually think about how you're going to make that work, um, you don't. Business plans are not for the bank, though they're, they're going to want to see it. They're not for the landlord. They're going to want to see it. They're for you. So if, uh, and you can call it a creative plan if you want to, but sit down and answer those questions for yourself. Um, whatever it is that's nagging at you. And if you don't know the answer, go find people. I met with experts all over the place. And let me tell you, I learned as much from the ones who were negative as from the ones who were positive. Do you know how many people said, I don't understand why you're not going to Cameron Village? What the hell? Why do you want to be in Mount Raleigh? Well, I have this mission statement, and it's about that. No, 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 no. You need to go to Cameron Village. Nobody's going to shop in Raleigh. So, um, so what I learned there is, OK, there's a mindset that I need to get over. Um, so, so so you got to um, really, really map it out and make the plan and, by God, write it down. Um, I have a funny slide, and I'm just going to quickly tell this story. I do like to take risks. All my little tests say that. I'm in this weird, like, 2% of the population on my Myers-Briggs. It's a very weird mashup. Um, interestingly, though, physical risks, not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> So here's my, here's my humorous side note. Um, I, I, my middle child is off in Europe tra traveling. He is a risk taker. Second children often are. He was the kid who jumped off things that were way too high, always had a scab somewhere. He's traveling Europe. Middle of the night, get a text. Everyone's OK. <laughs> I'm like hitting my husband in the ribs. <laughs> this shows up. <laughs> okay, dude's an athlete. He survived. <laughs> Everyone was okay. Glad he didn't tell me before he did it. And for those of you who haven't figured it out, he ran with the bulls in Pamplona. Um, I did th really want to throw up after I saw this. Um, and yet, I'm strangely proud of it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be showing you the picture. So, <laughs> not the kind of risks I would take. Um, another hilarious um, slide. I don't know if you know despair.com. And if you don't, you need to look it up, despair.com. They make fun of these corporate things. <laughs> Never let the fear of failure stop you from trying. Unless, of course, risk is taking as a company with a grand case of stupidity. That would be me if I ran with the bulls. All right, so my next, my next um, kind of advice, advice to you guys is to try to find your optimistic self. Um, I don't know why. Um, I don't know what turned me into such a freaky optimist. Um, it, and by the way, it does have downsides. Um, some people who've worked with me here before know I've made some bad hiring decisions because when I meet people, I'm like, oh, they could do this and they'd be great at that. Blah, blah, blah. You know, psycho killer is right there on the resume. <laughs> oh, yeah, but they're really good with people. <laughs> so it's not always a good thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, um, so, Try, if you're, if you're a naturally optimistic person, embrace it. If you're a person who automatically puts the brakes on, try to challenge yourself on that. And if you can't challenge yourself, get some friends who do it. I have some friends over here who, when I say yes too much, smack me outside the head and say, ah, did you really mean to say yes to that? <laughs> so um, so uh, keep yourself in check with that and, and keep your optimistic self. 
Jonathan, I'm going to keep going until you wave your flag, okay? Um, okay, so I visit cities. This is Baltimore, the American Visionary Art Museum, and if you ever get up there, you've got to go to this place. It's crazy. Um, I go to cities, and I find places that I love. Um, and so this was a lot of what, I, um, what inspired Deco. Um, and I'm just going to keep moving so I can get through my slides. Um, I um, want to talk about a mission statement. 25 years in nonprofits, master's degree in nonprofit. Every single class I took for my master's, the phrase mission driven came up. This is how you do it in the nonprofit world. You have a mission, you have a reason for existing, and all your decisions, it's your roadmap, all your decisions connect to that mission. Um, so when I moved over to the for profit world, I was really grappling with, you know, how do I, how do I make this something that's not just a place to make money? Um, and so I wrote a mission statement, and I encourage you to do the same thing. Um, you may, it may be a personal mission statement, you don't have to show it to anybody. But rack your brain and start thinking about those things that are really important to you. Um, is it integrity? Is it making money? Is it um, being seen? Is it not being seen? Is it putting food on? Whatever it is, write it down. It's just like that business plan. Just get it in there and articulate it to yourself. Um, so uh, created a business plan for DECO, uh, I mean a mission statement, and it involved all the, all the things that were sort of important to me. Uh, again, I mentioned a few of them, integrity, um, creativity, local, collaborative. I wanted it to be a supportive environment. Basically, I wanted it to be a business that could um, make me some money, but also um, contribute to the community, much like a nonprofit. Um, so fast forward. Uh, about a year. <laughs> this is when, we, when I knew I was on the right track. Um, we had a little group of um, girls who were about the size of that soccer team come in. They, it was an entrepreneur's camp, and some uh, moms were there. There were eight or nine of them. They came. We talked about business. We had a great time, and I got this wonderful little note. I hope you guys can see it. Dear Pam, I had a great time at Deco Raleigh. I learned some great facts about starting your own business. Parentheses, the bagels were fantastic. <laughs> and I loved using the cash register. <laughs> Lots of love, Hannah H. This is a doodle. <laughs> I love this. And I told Hannah she has a job when she's 16. <laughs> All right, I'm going to blow through these pictures. This is what Deco looked like before we moved in. Um, the proverbial blank slate. And this is what it looks like now. Um, the vision came from a lot of those places that um, we visited. Let me keep flipping my... Um, all right, so um, I think my next message to you about risk-taking is to practice. Um, I know that sounds weird, uh, but it, again, if you think about the things that you're good at that are risky to other people, it's because of practice. I'm standing up here floppy sweating, but actually, I'm okay, I'm not nervous, I'm all right. And that's because I have had to do this a lot in my life and I've practiced at it. The first few times I threw up before, I threw up after, I was shaking the whole time. Um, it's not that I'm any, there, I'm not any better or worse, it's just that I've, I've practiced more, okay? The other thing I've practiced a lot at is speaking up. Um, I told my friend Stephanie a story about me mouthing off to a teacher when I was in fourth grade. And man, he got up in my face and um, kind of gave me the ever do that again, you're going to get suspended. Scared the crap out of me. Um, but then kids came up to me afterwards and they were like, I'm so glad you said that. You know, and so that was the first time in my life of a gazillion times where I was the person who said the thing in the room that everybody was thinking. And of course, the more you do that, and the more often people come up and say, I'm so glad you said that, oh my God, you know, you start like, oh, well, this is my role. This is what I do. I take one for the team. Um, so practice. Um, my little, um, everybody starts somewhere. This is Gowdy. This, that was his first project there. And if you guys, this is, pro this is my bucket list visit, the, um, the uh, basilica in Barcelona that he designed. Um, but um, practice. So find something that you suck at or something that really makes you nervous. If it's going and asking for money, practice. Practice with friends. Put yourself in a situation where maybe, um, maybe it's not um, a grant that you particularly want, but there's an interview and it's a chance for you to practice. Practice, 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 okay? 
that sounds easy. I also have um, some just rules of how I do things. And I will say that um, 25 years of working in an environment where I had a board of directors and a staff and you know, in the nonprofit world, you're accountable to the public and always accountable, always accountable financially, whatever. Um, and of course, when you're the director, when bad shit happens, you're the one it comes down on, right? Um, we did the, uh, it was Coleman I was with, and we had the race for the cure, and you can imagine after race day, I, you know, I didn't get my free yogurt, I didn't get my whatever, you know, and so um, I learned that you have to be nice, just be nice. Um, I started to put no dicks, but um, that seemed a little. <laughs> um, my kids, my kids, I'm one of those people who will chat up a waiter. I will talk to somebody on a bus. We're, I'm traveling Europe a couple weeks ago, and we're, <laughs> we're at a really nice restaurant, and two of my kids are there with my husband, and the waiter comes over. It, he's Danish, right? He doesn't even speak English. And I open my mouth, and both my kids at the same time are like, don't do it, Mom. <laughs> So, um, but I'll tell you what, I have never gotten anything bad from being nice to people. Be honest. That's hard, and sometimes that's a real risk. That's a real risk. Being honest is not just thinking the honest thing, but sometimes it's saying the honest thing. Um, one of the things I've had to learn how to do is say no. Um, so, um, when I, I've been asked to be on a few boards because I've got this whole nonprofit thing, and um, my friend Jackie over here will tell you when I get interviewed to be on a board, I'm honest. Like, all right, I raise money for 25 years, do not want to raise money for you. I will help you with this, 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 and this. I will give you this much time. I, this is how I want to do this, and I will be happy, and you will be happy. Oh my God, everybody's so much happier. And usually the thing I say I will offer is the thing they want anyway. So. Um, so practice that. Practice saying what you need. Practice saying what you mean. It's good. Be grateful. <laughs> Seems obvious and you know, I don't know, uh, it, it, it's a little cliche to have that um, sort of gratitude moment here, but um, my gosh, I, um, I wake up every single morning right now and I think, oh, I'm happy. I slept last night. I get to have the best job in the world. I've got the best friends around me. I live in the best city. I'm, I'm really, really grateful. And believe me, you get to a certain age where you start counting toward the other end and not how old you are, but how many years you got left. And um, not to be maudlin, but um, gratitude is important and it kind of grounds you. Um, and then I do have this one other, other role. <laughs> Some of you have heard me say this. This is my guiding principle. No assholes. Probably the best thing about owning my own business, because again, when you're in an environment where you have a board, where you have you know, people all around you, um, you don't get to pick and choose who cares about that cause. Um, I, I do pick and choose. Um, and I'll tell you, I've had artists who've been at the store who've just been real jerks, and I, I, don't tell you, I don't say you're an asshole, go away. I just let them go. I, I just, I won't do it. And it makes my life happier if they're persistent about it, then I say I just don't think our work styles are compatible. Um, if there is a, um, one of my real, real commitments is being a good member of the community and supporting other businesses. But if there's somebody who's a jerk about that, I just won't play. And so, and I, I don't have to be aggressive, but I just won't play. And I encourage you to embrace this. It's liberating. It's really liberating. No assholes. All right, very quickly, I'm just going to tell you about a couple other things that have come out of this risk taking um, because Jonathan is probably dying. Hi. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> I'm not going to not talk about the parklet. Sorry. Um, uh, so, travels, the um, collaborative thing. Um, my friend Bob is over here who designed this parklet. You see the chronicle here. If you don't know the story, this is the first parklet in Raleigh. Um, to me, this is the kind of risk that I like taking. I like making things happen that really, to me, are low-hanging fruit. What this took was a little pushing, fundraising. It took talking to people in the city, getting people comfortable. Well, that's all stuff I can do. So we had these creative people who wanted to make this parklet happen. And I was like, all right, you bring that to the table. I'll bring this to the table. I'll help you raise the money. Let's make this thing happen. So. Um, 
to, to me, this is, this is my creative process, is kind of pushing, enabling, supporting, and letting things happen. Um, it did not come without a cost. We, I still pay for the parking spaces for it to be there. Um, and I did that because of the integrity thing. I just felt like if we're going to do the first one, it might be too much to push the city and say, um, can you do this? And by the way, can you give it to us for free? So um, we'll, we'll address that at some point. Um, this is another lesson I learned. I'm not going to um, I'm not going to belabor it, but this is, I took art classes. Um, one of my first paintings, my, my, I was really wound up and kind of in the, in the um, details, and she was like, stop it, you can always paint over it. Um, and I did. And not, so obviously the second time I painted over, it was like, oh, I'll just make these red. <laughs> this is the last time I painted over it. That's Galileo. <laughs> I'm married to a physicist, that was for him. Um, so, lesson well learned in art class. You can always paint over it. And I felt that way about the parkland. Now, that's not true about building an iconic building. For example, you can't just, oh, we don't like that, let's rip it down. But um, I think it's uh, liberating. Again, public art always catches my eye. Um, so the next idea um, that I had was, um, why, why should the, we do a mural on the, on the outside of the parklet, why should the parklet be the only place where this public art is happening? Went to Sarah Powers at BAE. Um, she sent me to Jed Gant, who's in the room somewhere, who was doing the Raleigh Murals Project. We got together and we founded the Flight Fund. Um, so basically, um, here's what I've decided to do. This is a risk. Um, I spend between twenty and thirty thousand dollars a year on advertising because the rules say that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to spend X percent on advertising. So what I decided was um, this year, all my contracts are now done, right Julie? Um, this year instead of spending that money on ads, I'm going to put it into a fund and um, we're going to identify cool projects in the community. We're going to work with our friends at Art Space and VAE and CAM, and we're going to um, give grants to artists that include money for the artists um, and also help pay for things that cost money that usually comes out of their pockets materials, permits, that kind of thing. So, this is our website. Um, the city of Raleigh wanted to um, try a pop up shop, of course. Who'd they come to? The one who said, who will say yes to any risk. Um, <laughs> So um, I didn't want the pop-up shop just to be about Deco making money, so we decided it would be a fundraiser for the flight fund. We donated 10% of sales. We gave uh, $7,000 to the fund. Um, Jed, wherever he is, we're going to be awarding our first um, grant in the next couple weeks. We're also transforming this space with the help of the folks at um, Art Space and VAE, and we're going to do an artist installation there. We've asked uh, five artists to send applications for transforming the space into like a life-size diorama. So in about three weeks, you'll be able to see that. Um, to me, this is low-hanging fruit. This is a mural that got approved yesterday. It took seven months. I had to sign a thing saying I had divested all my investments in Iran. Not a word of a lie. So that we could put a, we could, we could put a, a mural on the ground. This is a bird's eye view looking down at the parklet. So the parklet's here. Jen Hales, um, a local artist, will be doing this mural for a sidewalk mural in Raleigh. Again, this is about pushing through that first time because what's a risk today will be commonplace tomorrow. All right, here we go. I'm wrapping up. This is the end. <laughs> okay, so to me, risk taking is about bravery. And I think what I would like to challenge um, everybody to do, you guys are, you guys are, the creative class in Raleigh. And I will tell you, I've been here since 1993. You could hear a pin drop on the brown and vanilla streets of downtown Raleigh. It was the most boring, god-awful town. You guys are the ones who are transforming it, the people in this room. And the only way this is going to continue to be the best place to live is if we keep taking risks, we keep pushing the envelope, we, and we let our elected officials know that we like risk, that risk is what is our personality. We are innovators, we're creators, we're entrepreneurs, and that's who we are. They need to feel comfortable with that. They need to feel that there isn't any danger in doing something like a bike share program. Why was that risky? I don't know. 
Um, but that was a real threat to some folks. It took some lobbying by real human beings to say, ha ha, this will transform our city and here's why. So speak up and embrace the risks and help make Raleigh the kick-ass town that we all know it is. I love this quote. If you don't build your dreams, someone else will hire you to build theirs. So what are you waiting for? That's the end.